Ja, hallo. So, um, the topic of today are Feynman rules, um, which basically uh, completes this very, very short chapter on how to calculate cross sections and uh, decay rates. And so last time we touched uh, the the general aspects of uh, cross sections and decay rates, um, and general in the sense that, uh, well, for this general phase space uh, considerations and so on, it does not matter which particular interaction one has. Um, and Feynman rules, on the other hand, are exactly if one has an interaction, how to deduce the corresponding uh, matrix elements for the transition of your of the initial states of a reaction to the final states of a reaction. Um, well, and then this matrix element, or actually the modulus square, enters um, cross sections and decays as in these formulas which we have uh, discussed last time. Um, what I thought uh, would be useful is that we just go through the, some simple examples. Uh, but again, as always, first a question to you. What you would suggest that we discuss? Examples. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah. Do you have any examples? Otherwise, I come up with one. I I have a question from. Hmm? Uh, one example, explain it, go through it. Or it's like, if you have the derivative of a field, then you get an extra exponential function. Ah, yeah, I also had the same question when I was looking at the, uh, in the lecture notes. Mm -hmm. When there is the, the mu phi, yep. and you write the Fourier decomposition, I don't, know, I don't know why, but it seems there is like an extra exponential. I don't know if it's a, it's, if it's a type or it must be like that. Okay, I, anyway, my, my idea was to have one example with derivatives. Okay. So then, uh, okay, then I think at the appropriate place you can come in and say now there is this extra exponential, what does it come from? Um, okay, so my, um, yeah, so basically my suggestion is, uh, I mean, I, just pull out now one interaction out of my head and uh, we go through all steps which are involved calculating. I would suggest we, we start calculating a matrix element of a decay, one body to two, and then we can use the same, uh, we can actually use the same Lagrangian and calculate the reaction two to two. Okay, so just that we have two different things. Um, <coughs> So, so this is, okay, the whole thing is about Feynman knife, Feynman rules. And the example I take is, well, concerning spins and all that, um, as simple as possible, I just look at scalars and well, one reason why I do that is, is actually, I mean, in most of, the, most of the problems we will discuss in these lectures concern mesons and not, uh, and not baryons, except at the end uh, of the course uh, where I would uh, leave some freedom to you to influence where, how to continue. Uh, but, okay, so most of the things will concern mesons. Um, either with spin zero or with spin one. Um, so let's start with something with spin zero, okay? Um, so suppose I have an interaction Lagrangian, which, um, well, involves three mesons. And, um, okay, I just, just for, well, for the sake of the argument, let me choose two different types of mesons. Um, yeah, maybe I write down the whole Lagrangian and it's clear. Um, okay, I want basically one heavy meson and the possibility that this decays into two 
lighter ones. In the lighter two, I choose identical because then we can also discuss this issue of symmetry factors and so on, which is always a little bit tricky how to calculate that. Okay, with all these uh, um, arguments, so let me write down something. I write down also now the free Lagrangian, basically that one can see the masses, how they show up. Uh, for the calculation, what matters, of course, is the interaction part. Okay, so free Lagrangian, first um, we take a light field, which I call phi. And this should have a mass small m. And I take a somewhat heavier scalar field, which I call chi. And this should have the mass capital M. And now finally comes the interaction term, which uh, I choose. Okay, the sign is arbitrary, um, and I give okay, my coupling constant, I call H, and I have a chi d mu phi d mu phi. And actually, for okay, sorry, for convenience, since we have two times an identical field, this is not pure convention. One can do that differently. I write here h over 2. <coughs> so I also could call this h over 2 coupling constant, so that this one half is pure convention. Um, let me, well, let's first do some checks whether all this is reasonable, what's written down here. So first of all, um, I have introduced here two derivatives where the Lorentz index is con contracted, so the whole thing is scalar. Um, there is no preferred direction. Um, well then, uh, the fields as I have introduced them are all real. There is, uh, or permission, they have no charge. Um, therefore, I can also construct these uh, well, these interaction terms where I combine three of these guys, if all of them had a charge, this could be, this could be complicated to uh, combine them. Or then one has to be much more uh, careful and maybe write down additional terms. And, yeah, well, again, uh, one reads off here the mass of these guys here, which come in here in a pair, and the mass capital M of this guy, chi. Um, okay, so that's it. Um, now we can look for reactions. Now, typically, if one has the first thing I would like to discuss is a decay. Um, the decay, first, let's get some kinematics clear. Um, so, on purpose, I took here a capital M and here a small m. This is to stress that capital M should be bigger than small m. Um, still, this is actually not enough um, to make this chi decay into two phi's to, make, to ensure that the capital M must be bigger than two times small m. Otherwise, there is, uh, I mean, otherwise, energetically, it's not possible that this chi field, or the chi particle decays into two phi particles. <coughs> so the decay chi to two phi is possible if capital M is bigger than two times M. On the other hand, reactions of two particles to two particles, for example, a reaction of chi and phi to chi and phi. That's always possible. This is an elastic scattering that's anyway always possible. A reaction, um, what else could I imagine? Uh, well, phi phi to two phi is also always possible. Um, okay, one can think of also other reactions. Um, So let's first look at this here. 
And um, <coughs> let's first, before I do any calculation, let, let me get the concepts clear. This here yields an equation of motion which is not linear and therefore plane waves are not a solution of that. There is interaction going on. And whenever one has interaction in a quantum field theory, well not whenever, but in, in all practical cases when one has interactions in a quantum field theory, this means one cannot solve any problem exactly. Except for rather simple ones. Um, so this decay, even if allowed, we cannot actually calculate exactly. However, if, and this is what's used in this Feynman rules, uh, if, this M, if this H here is a small quantity, then one can do perturbation theory, then one basically can start out drawing diagrams, assigning an importance to these diagrams and figuring out that um, well, there is, as we will see, there is one diagram which is dominant relative to all the others. Um, so let's see how that goes. <coughs> the interaction vertex, <laughs> without any calculation, is proportional to H. Okay, um, so this I also obtained afterwards by a detailed calculation of translating this, this vertex to momentum space, reading of Feynman rules, but whatever appears there with momenta and so on, um, anyway, it is proportional to H. Um, then let me um, introduce one more thing. Mm -hmm. We have to give names to, or well, names or um, diagrammatic meaning to these different particles. And um, it's completely up to you how you do that, but do not draw too complicated lines, otherwise, uh, well, you will never finish drawing your diagrams. So I would suggest um, we call a dashed line a chi field, a chi particle. And a full line is a five particle. And now we can, before we do any calculations and even before we derive the detailed expression for the vertex, let's start to draw some diagrams and convince ourselves what is the most important thing, what is then, well, the next most important, and so on. Okay, so what we want to do is now, we draw diagrams and um, and all of them for uh, the case <coughs> that H is small. To be honest, I cheat a little bit here, as always, uh, you know, the lectures are always cheating. This H is a dimensionful quantity. This has dimension 1 over mass. So, you know, when one has a dimension less <laughs> quantity and say this is small, then you can imagine, well, this is small, 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 100, this is small, right? So something which is small, one always has so the idea compared to 1. If something is dimensionful, it cannot be small compared to 1, because it has a dimension. Um, it will turn out that if one calculates now things in a power series in H, of course some dimensionful quantities will multiply the H. And this will be some momenta, because these derivatives give rise to momenta. So in a sense, we will assume that 
the typical momenta in our reactions um, are such that if one constructs from the momenta and the h dimensionless quantities, the appropriate dimensionless quantities which come out from the calculations, that whatever appears there is a dimensionless quantity, that this is small. <clears throat> um, maybe afterwards we try to um, we try to estimate that a little bit. But okay, let's first draw some diagrams. I'm interested in this decay, so we will not draw now a arbitrary diagrams, but some diagrams where we have as final states, as uh, external states, final or initial, these guys. One dashed line and two full lines. And the simpler thing one can imagine is this here. Okay? So whenever there is a vertex, this has to do <coughs> with this H. These vertices come from the interactions. And otherwise, either one has external lines, which start or end somewhere. These are, this correspond to the reaction you are after. Or there are internal lines, which connect two vertices. But well, here there are none. This is the most simple thing one can imagine, and this is proportional to H. So can you imagine anything which has the same external lines but, well, more vertices? Suggestions? A loop. A loop with the, the, uh, the phi field. Uh -huh. And then another dashed line and then another vertex like this one. All right, okay. So, for example, I could have something like this. Is this what you mean? Uh, no, the, the other one. The, the other you one? You close the, the phi line, uh -huh. and then you add another uh, dashed line. You make a loop with the phi line, not with the chi. Uh. <laughs> but only use this vertex, okay? <laughs> oh yeah, that's okay. Yeah, okay. And now, yeah, yeah okay. Mm -hmm. That's good, yeah. So first of all, these guys are, these have three, have these guys have three vertices, okay? One here, one here, one here. So this is, since every vertex brings an H, this is proportional to H cubed. The same is true here, one, two, three. Um, and let me also add, can you imagine one more? There is one more. The correction to the vertex? Mm -hmm. Yep. In a sense, I correct here, correct in a sense that I, so I modify here this line. Okay, this one cause, well in this case, <laughs> it's a correction, it's a so-called wave function renormalization of the external states, but in general you could say this is a similar to a propagated correction. So it's one corrects a line. Here one also corrects a line, um, namely this incoming one. So I have basically this line, but uh, in between there is something which corrects it. And it's a correction because h, the h is supposed to be small. Whereas this here corrects the vertex. You have, like initially here, this dashed line incoming and these two full lines outgoing and then there is something in between going on which I only can understand as a kind of modification of this three-point object. All these guys here, um, if you make a bookkeeping, go with h to the power of three. And um, if you can come up with one more diagram which goes with h to the power of three, you are more clever than I am. 
so I see at the moment only these three. <coughs> I hope you can imagine I can also write down things which go with h, say, to the power of 5. For example, by, well, say, modifying the other line in addition, modifying this line, or also <coughs> doing modifications here, like connecting these two guys by a dashed line, or connecting this line and this here by a dashed line, and so on. Um, so, in principle, there, can, there are infinitely many diagrams, but if H is small, or some proper combination of H and some dimension for quantity, if this is small, then um, whatever I calculate here is less important than this. And whatever I calculate at order h to the power of 5 is less important than these three here. Okay? <clears throat> so whatever I have not written down is h. Okay, I have no proof now for you that the next correction is not h to the power of 4, but um, actually that's the case. So for the argument of, uh, of the expansion, it does not matter. Um, <clears throat> so if h is small, in whatever sense, this here is the dominant part. And now in practice, in practice this works like, uh, this works in the following way. Suppose this is the only interaction we have in our universe. Okay. Um, then experimentalists would start out calculating the decay rate of this process. Um, what did I say? Calcul measuring the decay rate of this process. Um, And of course, theoreticians would start out calculating that. And now suppose we know the age from somewhere else. I mean, usually, of course, one needs first an experiment which tells me how big is a quantity. For example, in electrodynamics, which we already discussed, one experiment has to tell me how large is, for example, the electron charge. This does not come for free. It's not that there is... Uh, that there is um, any microscopic theory at the moment which would tell me, say, the electron charge is 1 over pi. Actually, this is on purpose because the electron charge in natural units is about 0.3. So, I mean, 1 over pi is not so far away. Um, but it is not 1 over pi. <laughs> um, anyway, um, I mean, the point is, of course, typically coupling constants <coughs> are determined by experiment, but they are determined by experiment once. And then one fixes that with a theory, one describes this experiment with a theory, and, and therefore then has, a, has an input for, well, the input values for your theory, and then you can make predictions for other processes. So let's suppose from somewhere else we know what this age is. And we have figured out it is small, otherwise this whole expansion here does not make sense. Then we would start out calculating what the experimentalists are measuring. And we would first calculate this here. And if we are brave, okay, let's also calculate this. And we would see how important is this contribution here relative to that, and from that we would get an estimate how important is this stuff which we have neglected, because this is then further down. And since this is a Taylor expansion, one even can get an estimate from the last term which one has considered, one can actually get an estimate how big the terms are which one has not considered. Um, at least that's the, the principal idea. Okay. Now say the experimentalists make a measurement and this has an accuracy which is 
well, less good than my calculation of this plus these terms. Then, for the moment, actually, as a theoretician, I would go home and say, okay, now let's wait. Uh, yeah, and, of course, I should say, and there is agreement between experiment and theory. I'll, and then I would go home and say, okay, I mean, my calculation is more precise than what the experiment gives, um, so let's wait until the experiments are getting better. Since I have made a prediction which anyway supersedes the experimental result. <coughs> if there is a disagreement, uh, of course, then I should refine my theory. Or then, I mean, strictly speaking, then the theory is wrong and one should develop a better one. Or maybe a completely different one or an improved version of that. Okay, but if it agrees with the experiment and the calculated accuracy is better than the experiment, there is no need to do anything. Then there is no need to calculate these terms here. Because anyway, one is already better than experiment. Of course, the experimentalists, they are also eager. I mean, they start to improve that then. And they know, of course, they know what my accuracy is. So they try to reach that. Then again, it can be that they are in agreement with uh, what I have now predicted. Or in disagreement, if in disagreement, I mean, one has to, well, refine the theory. If they reach the accuracy of uh, this prediction here, which goes now up to order h cube, um, well, then I can start out doing an improved calculation and calculate also these diagrams here. And then the game starts again with, uh, can the experiment become better than or a comparable, can that reach a comparable accuracy as the theory and so on. I tell you that, that you should get an, a feeling that there is no need to calculate here infinitely many diagrams. Okay, so there is actually no need to exactly solve a theory if one has an approximation scheme which one can continuously improve. And the, the guideline when to improve is basically how accurate is actually the experiment. <coughs> okay, what I want to do now is, uh, coming to, so more to the practical things, is we calculate this here. We will not calculate, not even this, uh, I think. <coughs> I mean, this is going too far, first of all, I think this is something which is... Uh, better done in a quantum field theory course to calculate these loop corrections. Um, and for most of the things which we discuss in these lectures, uh, we will not need these corrections. So anyway, I mean, we want to understand, first of all, the qualitative features of things. Okay, so let's uh, tackle this here. So far, I have only <coughs> tried to convince you this is proportional to H, uh, but nothing else yet. Um, Okay, so um, now to seriously calculate a vertex, one does, as described in the lecture notes, one starts um, actually not with a Lagrangian, but with i times the Lagrangian. And one, one takes here this interaction Lagrangian. So this is L interaction. Um, and actually, one does not start with uh, Lagrangian, but with the action. So i times integral d4x, uh, and then it's minus h over 2, um, chi of x, mu phi of x, mu phi of x. <coughs> This would be completely okay if in an experiment typically one resolves where a particle exactly is. But actually what one typically does in an experiment is one knows what momentum a particle has and not exactly where it is. So one knows the momentum to a very, very good degree, but 
where the particle is on a microscopic scale, and this is what we talk about, um, I mean, this we just don't know. I mean, macroscopically, we know where it is. It's in, say, a particle is in the beam or somewhere in the target, but uh, microscopically, <laughs> say, on a, on an accuracy of one femtometer, we don't know that. Um, however, we know the corresponding, uh, we know the momentum to a very, very good extent. Um, and therefore, uh, basically all cross-section formulas and so on are formulated in terms of momenta of particles with the understanding uh, that the best description of a particle is to characterize it by a momentum, basically in an idealized way by a plane wave and not uh, by something well located at a position but with an uh, well, with an undetermined momentum. This is just does not fit to the experimental situation, that's why one does not do that. Um, okay, going to momentum space. Um, no, I always had to get the signs uh, clear. Well, we write the phi of x as a momentum integral. In, well, in energy and momentum, this is a four-dimensional space-time vector, and this we now represent in its Fourier components. So it's a d4 q um, e to um, well, we do <coughs> d4 q normalized to, to multiples of two pi and um, minus i ux phi of q, let me call this phi twiddle. Um. <coughs> mm -hmm. And uh, we do this now for each of these phi fields and also for the chi. And of course, we have to come up uh, with different momenta because now we have three different four dimensional momentum, uh, energy momentum integrals. So let me call um, so let me call the momentum which corresponds to this, to the Fourier transform of this guy K, and the momentum of these two uh, <coughs> P and Q. Okay, so we have I, we have a minus H over 2, which has well, no momenta and so on. And then we have a d4x. Um, and then let me first write down all the momenta involved. d4k over 2 pi to the fourth power d4, d4 p to the power of 2 pi 4 and the d4q. 2 pi 4. And uh, then I connect all these coefficients here, minus i k x, minus i p um, um, p x, and okay, now we should, now I should be a little bit more careful. Uh, there are some derivatives acting here, sorry for that. So, of course, these derivatives I have to Take care of so okay. Let me first write down the whole thing. Chi of k, and uh, now we have a derivative mu x, and this acts on um, e to the minus i p x by little of p and uh, d mu x e to the minus i q x by little of q. Okay, clear where that comes from. So I put in, for example, here for this d mu phi of x. Okay, let me take talk about the very last one. D mu phi of x, I put in this here. Then there is a derivative acting on that. It does not act on this momentum integrals. That's why I put that to the very left. And then what's left is this d mu x acting on this 
integrand here. Okay? And I do the same thing for this guy, but call the momentum P. And I do the same thing for this guy and call the momentum K. <clears throat> now one reason why one is doing that is that now these derivatives before they acted on the fields, and we don't know what the value of the field is, um, but now they act actually on a plane wave, because this is the only x-dependence. But this is what one always is doing. Um, I mean, remember how you solve differential equations with constant coefficients? Uh, you basically translate derivatives, you introduce Fourier transforms, and you translate derivatives to numbers. To momenta or uh, to yeah, momenta or uh, frequencies. Same thing here. Okay. Suddenly, you can assign a value to that. All right. So let's rewrite it one more time. If I take here the derivative of this um, exponential, it gives me minus i times p mu. And here this derivative gives me minus i times q mu. And um, once I have that, I basically can, well, it's, basically, it's x independent. I want to do one more thing. I want to interchange the x integration with this momentum integration. Okay, so this is minus 5 times h over 2, then let me first do all these momentum integrations, e 4 k over 2 pi to the fourth power e 4 p, and e 4 q, and um, now let me collect all these factors which do not depend on x, this is a kite riddle of K. And this derivative acting here gives a minus i p mu. Then I have here a phi twin of p. This derivative acting here gives a minus i q mu. And I have a phi twin of q. And finally, in here, um, let me write this in the second line, I have a d4x e to the, now let me collect all these factors here, e to the minus i k plus p plus q times x. Okay, I have evaluated the derivatives, um, well, took all that together with these momentum integrals, and what's left here is one integral over space and time. And this is the only x dependence, and this I can now carry out. This gives a delta function, actually it gives four delta functions. And it's a delta function in k plus p plus q, which is nothing but energy momentum conservation um, at this vertex. I can interpret this k as the uh, momentum of a chi particle flowing into this vertex and correspondingly the p and the q. Okay, so what is then the result of the whole thing? This is uh, Minus i is <coughs> over 2 um, integral d 4 k pi to the power <coughs> If one wants, uh, one can now, I mean, evaluate one of these integrals. Uh, but actually, it's better to leave it here as it is, and uh, I mean, just remember 
when one draws the diagram that there is energy momentum conservation, So now let's take uh, these guys together here. So there is a um, okay. There is first this all the fields. And there is a minus i <coughs> square and a p dot q. This P here is contracted with this Q, so this is a scalar product of these two form momenta. So, what was the problem now with the exponential? Yeah, there was only a typo in the, ah. the notes. Yeah, I think yeah. there was, there is one equation, one and Two, three, eight? Yes, yeah. there's two the exponential the functions with Q2. Ah. Because when you derive, you already obtain another exponential. Oh, I see. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah, that's right. This. Oh, this ex Okay, yes, there is one too much. You're right. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Good. Nobody noticed that so far. <laughs> Um, which means this best exponential is probably wrong. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Can I borrow your pen? Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Good. Very good that you went through that. Um, <coughs> okay. Uh, so, the, I mean, the bottom line of all that is, in the end, there should not be any exponentials left. Uh, there should not be any exponentials left. Um, and, I mean, if, if in the formulas you see two exponentials with the same uh, argument, then probably one is too much. Okay. Um, Yeah. Good. Now we come back to, uh, well, now we read off the vertex. And now we should become a little bit more quantitative, not just drawing a diagram, but assigning momenta to each line. Um, so this was my k, the, remember the dashed line corresponds to the chi. And by the way, the twiddles I have only introduced to distinguish the, more, the, uh, the Fourier transform from the original field, I think in the lecture notes I didn't do that. Um, then there is one momentum um, of this guy and by well, by definition, all momenta are actually incoming here. Uh, so all of them move towards the vertex um, as I've introduced them. If I want to know the momenta of the outgoing part, because this is just the opposite. So if the ingoing momentum is Q, the outgoing is minus Q. But I've, I always have to keep track of my definitions here. And uh, it's always, it's a good rule, I mean, not to confuse oneself, that one first assigns momenta which go in, which go in the vertex, uh, especially if one has momenta. Otherwise, uh, you can confuse yourself utterly much. So just draw it in that way, and when you want to know in the end the momentum, I mean, then just use the negative uh, if there is a decay. Uh, if it's a decay of this guy to these two, then the outgoing moment is on our minus p and minus q. Um, for loops, 
it actually does not matter in which direction you assign momenta, that's completely up to you, but do it in a consistent way. Um, okay, and now we, uh, we read off the vertex factor basically by well, taking everything except for the momentum integrals and the fields and the energy momentum uh, delta function in these two pi's. So we read off now it's minus i times h over 2 times this back here. So <coughs> minus i h over 2 um, minus i square p dot k and um, well let's include here the energy momentum delta function this is that k is minus p minus q one can get rid of all these uh, these eyes floating around here. I keep them here to the end that you see the generic structure. The generic structure is a derivative is replaced by minus i times the momentum and then it's the momentum flowing into the vertex. Uh, but I mean once one has written down everything here are two momenta so there are two factors of this minus i uh, and minus i squared is minus so in the end this is i times one half h p dot q <coughs> okay this is the vertex but uh, well now we want to calculate the decay amplitude. Now, by chance, the decay amplitude to lowest order is just essentially what the vertex is, because there is nothing more here. Now comes, um, so this is the vertex, now comes the second Feynman rule. Um, the lowest order in powers of h decay amplitude is well one writes down a vertex and one has to read off what do the external lines mean and actually for scalars this is completely simple for the external lines you just write down one um, and actually what one gets is not the decay amplitude but i times the decay amplitude so there are always some conventions floating around here so i times the decay amplitude of the reaction chi to 2 phi is given by this expression here um, However, there is something missing here, and this is the so-called symmetry factor. The symmetry factor tells how many ways do I have to obtain the process I want to have from, well, from a given diagram. And this goes as follows. Um, this is the diagram I'm after because this was my leading order diagram. As long as I do not assign any momenta, this here can be the first of my two phi's or the second one. 
This here for sure is my chi because there is only one chi line here. But these two lines here are identical. I cannot distinguish them. And therefore, I can assign either um, I can assign either this here to the first of these two files or the other one. So either basically I have uh, this situation here, then I have k and um, p and q, or I have this here. And this gives a factor of 2. So the symmetry factor is 2. <coughs> Actually, this is why I've chosen this one half here. Because then Conveniently, um, the final vertex is just I times H times P dot Q. And now, finally, let me do one more step. Basically, concerning the matrix element, um, now the matrix element itself is then H bar of that. Uh, H. The matrix element uh, is then H times P dot Q. For a decay of one particle into two, um, we have discussed last time, there is no free kinematical variable. Everything is actually fixed by knowing the mass of the initial state and knowing the masses of the final states. And um, well, but here it seems as if we have two free momenta, P and Q. But actually that's not true because first of all we have a relation between the initial momentum and the final momentum and each of these particles, because it's a decay, each of these particles satisfies an energy-momentum relation. Well, not because it's a decay, but because we start with a single particle state and we end up with two single particle states. So energy and momentum are always related. Um, and this we can use here as follows. So finally is the kinematics again. And this is that capital M square. <coughs> this is the mass square of my initial particle. Well, this must be K square because K is the particle which comes in here. And on the other hand, we know that on this vertex is energy momentum conservation, so k plus q plus p is zero, or in other words, k is minus p minus q square. And this I can evaluate now, the minuses go away, and this is then p square plus q square plus two times p dot q. Well, but what is p squared? The mass of the, the mass of one of these decaying guys, and the same is true for q squared. In principle, I could have used also three different types of fields now. I mean, this always works. Uh, so this is two times small m squared plus two times p dot q, and what you see now is that p dot q is given in terms of Mass is fixed from outside. There is no freedom in this variable p dot q. It is given by numbers, by the masses of the involved particles. So p dot q is uh, one half m square minus two small m square.
software, and this I can plug in here. So this here is um, one half h times m squared minus m squared. So this is the mass, and this here is the matrix element. <coughs> Which means, and this is of course generally true for a one to two body reaction, the matrix element is just a number. Well, actually it's dimensionful. Um, but nonetheless, I mean, it, it does not depend on any variable which I can play with. Um, it's just given by the masses of the involved particles. Okay, now I would suggest we make a break. <laughs> okay, I, um, I kept here the vertex. Um, I mean, to calculate something else, but basically the calculation of the decay to leading order in H, I mean, this was it. Okay, so this was the matrix element. One plugs that into the formula which uh, one has for the two body decays, and well, that's it. Um, are there, first of all, are there questions to this calculation? Which I have now erased. <laughs> um, no? Okay. Um, so now we could do with the same interaction, we could do different reactions, of course, not only a decay. Um, what I don't want to go through is are the corrections to order H cubed, because I mean, then we, we write down a lot of things uh, which I think is not very much more illuminating, um, except if you say now that this is the thing which I would like to see most. Otherwise, I would suggest uh, we look at other reactions. And of course, um, so maybe I should also write down one more time the, the interaction, the Gaussian. So this was minus h over 2 chi d mu phi d mu phi. Um, so this is the one thing, and we have to write the form of the vertex. What should we calculate? Let's calculate a reaction. First, let, okay, let's calculate two particles going to two. So um, how about um, so two 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 reactions? So how about, um, say, a reaction of two phi's going to chi phi? Does would that work? Oh, that's a typical thing for a guess. So who thinks uh, this is something non-zero? Okay, if I ask that way, they probably know. So who thinks it's zero? <laughs> Yeah, okay, so let's start, yeah. You're right, let's write it down, seriously. Uh, so suppose I do phi and phi going to chi and phi. Okay, so there are some, okay, most of you obviously don't want to guess. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean, probably, Max, what would you say? Do you have a good reason why this is zero? Uh, you, you don't have any vertex for it, so. Yeah, so the, the issue is, I mean, if you try to imagine how this would look like in diagrams, you just do not come up with a, with a proper diagram. You can see it a little bit more formally, uh, because, you know, the formal arguments are then more convincing. Whenever you have one chi, you produce two phi's. Okay? 
And therefore, um, I mean, it's rather likely that in total, an even number of phi's is involved in a reaction. This is basically the same what you said, but uh, uh, the so here we have an odd number of phi's. And this you just do not get by that vertex. Um, whenever you have a chi involved, this produces two phi's. Uh, so at some point you have to get rid of that. Uh, if you want an odd number of phi's, but there is no way to get rid of that. You can produce an odd number of chi's, because there is a vertex with just one chi, but, uh, well, you cannot do anything else. One step more formal, even if, if this does not convince you, I mean, typically the last convincing argument is a symmetry. Suppose I change my phi field to minus phi. Okay? This would not change the Lagrangian at all because all terms, the free field terms and this interaction term, remain invariant if I replace the phi by minus phi. However, if I can imagine such an amplitude with an odd number of phi's, I would change this amplitude to its negative. And this can just not be. If everything remains invariant under change phi to minus phi, then also each single amplitude has to remain invariant. Which means if it, changes to its, if it changes to its negative, it must be zero. And on the diagrammatic level, it's not that you draw diagrams and figure out the result of a calculation is zero, but just, as Max said, you, you cannot draw any diagram, actually. Okay, um, <coughs> so this does not, ex um, well, the, the matrix element of that, phi plus phi, phi plus phi is zero. Um, and one cannot draw such diagrams. There are sometimes also cases where a symmetry forbids a process, but nonetheless there might be single diagrams which are non-zero, but only if one adds up everything required one obtains zero. But in this case, one cannot even draw the diagram. Okay, now, so I have now suggested the most stupid uh, possibility. So what else should we calculate? basically the same thing no matter what we calculate now. Um, so either we do now, okay, there are, uh, okay, I can imagine uh, three possibilities. Yeah, what's possible? Mm -hmm. Right. So one possibility is chi phi going to chi plus phi. At first, let's first write down what one can imagine and then uh, we make a choice. Um, phi, phi, two phi, phi. Hmm, right, we can have phi plus phi, phi plus phi. If I think about it, I even can imagine now four things. Kai, 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 kai. Yeah, this was now the fourth thing. I, in the beginning, I didn't thought about that. Yes. So all these are elastic scattering reactions. One has the same initial and final states, but there is also, I mean, strictly speaking, two inelastic two possible inelastic reactions. Here I've come up with an inelastic one. Here the initial state and the final is different. Five plus phi goes to chi to chi. Mm -hmm. Right, so there is five plus phi going to chi 
plus pi and the opposite reaction now is not the same. I mean, here the back reaction would look the same as the initial, but here it's, it's different. So read this as two possible reactions. So I can have two chi's scattering to two phi's or uh, vice versa. Um, <coughs> Let me say one thing about experiments uh, before we move on. Um, so if this was all we have in our world, just two types of particles, and um, again, let's assume the chi is heavier than the phi, so heavy that it can decay. Um, then first of all, the phi particles, they are stable. There is nothing they can decay to, there is nothing lighter. Um, so for sure, such a reaction is possible. I can have stable particles scattering in the end producing stable particles. If the lifetime of the chi is long enough such that I can produce it, accelerate it, shoot it on something before it decays, then also such a re then also the then also these two reactions are conceivable. We have such cases. For example, pions. Charged pions, they are not stable. They decay after a while to muons uh, and to muons and new neutrinos uh, most of the time. But they, are, they live so long that uh, basically one can produce them and shoot, shoot them on other targets before they decay into the muon branch. Um, they are also so stable um, and then actually they reach detectors when they are produced, but they, they, more or less this is the same story. Um, I mean, if we can accelerate something, then it's then we probably can also detect it. Um, so if the chi, if this h is small, and this is anyway what we assumed, then the chi will live quite long. I mean, depending now on absolute numbers, of course. Uh, and then, the, I mean, the typical scale then probably is the mass of the chi times this coupling constant which was dimensionful. If this is sufficiently small, uh, one can do all experiments which I, which I have enumerated here. Otherwise, the only thing which one can do would be, well, when one has phi's in the initial state. Okay, fine. Now, um, now I have to think about what I want to exclude. <laughs> um, okay, what do you what do you want to calculate? I exclude actually this one here. This is uh, this has a loop right from the start. Um, so this here in lowest order would would look like this. So this I don't want to calculate. Um, so yeah. Can you also imagine changing the fields in A? So yes, but again this would be zero. Yeah, okay, so it's the same. Yeah, that's the same. Um, right, I can also write it down. So also, i plus phi, phi plus phi, that's also zero. <coughs> Um, now, the, the switch between the, the, the lines, the types of lines, right? So, and for chi and phi, which is... For chi and phi? Where, where are you now? For uh, or, uh, yeah, the Thiemann diagram. This here? Uh, which ah, is yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Um, that's true, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. That's right. Um, that's right, sorry. Okay, um, so now we have to make a decision. <coughs> so who wants to calculate this here? Two, five. 
oh, this is nearly the maturity. How about this? Not so many. One, two. Uh, this, uh, this I exclude. Um, this one. Right. <laughs> hey, do we have double votes here? <laughs> um, uh, um, uh, then let's do this. Okay. Um, Okay, um, maybe as a first step, it's always good to write down something generic. And generic is, I just have my external lines and I write a big blob uh, in between and then I try to figure out what is, what could be in there. Um, so this is now not a final <laughs> diagram yet, it's more a picture of how it generically looks like. And, um, well, what we have are vertices which always connect one chi with two phi's. Which means if I want to uh, uh, have this chi here, at some point I have to create it from two full lines. Now these two full lines, I mean, I'm now after the simplest things, not, not a diagram with ten loops and so on. Uh, okay, I imagine that, okay, let me draw this again a little bit. I imagine that I have here these Kai guys and um, they must come from somewhere. Now either these two lines have something to do with my two initial states, but then this here would not be connected to anything, uh, then it's actually not a scattering diagram if it falls apart. Um, or I managed to connect uh, well these two in some way, and then what's left is this here. So this, uh, I mean, it looks a little bit ugly now from my from my way I, how I've motivated it, but I mean you, you can bend your Feynman diagrams arbitrarily. I mean that's not uh, does not change the the topological structure of it. There is actually um, one more possibility. And now let me specify what we have here. So these are momenta p1, p2. So let's say these are incoming, and we want momenta p. 3 and P4 outgoing. And well, any idea what could be the second diagram which I can draw? So let me, okay, so let me also do this here. So this is what's meant by this diagram here. Anything else you can imagine? Upper line goes down. Yeah. So I can imagine uh, now I draw it a little bit nicer that this upper line is actually connected to this guy here. I suppose this is what you meant, right? Um, I can imagine also something where I, I interchange the initial lines. But actually this is nothing new. So the art of drawing Feynman diagrams is not that you draw all funny possibilities, but that they are really distinct from each other. Now why are these two types distinct? Because this guy here with the momentum P3 meets with a guy of momentum P1 at the very same vertex. And this is not the case here. Here is P1 on this vertex and P3 is on this. So these two are really distinct. Whereas 
let me interchange these initial states here. This here connects at one vertex the P1 with the P4, and that's the same as this. So this is not a new diagram. So these two are really distinct because the physics is distinct. Different, I first assign concrete momenta to my initial and final states and then either I see that these guys which have these momenta meet at one vertex or not. These are really two possibilities but this here I can basically redraw by just exchanging this line here and then I get that. This here is at order h squared. We have two vertices here. And there is nothing more what one can draw at order h squared. Okay, now let's give names to these diagrams. This is diagram A, this is diagram B. Um, so let's talk about diagram A. Um, let's start, before I write down a formula, let's determine the symmetry factor. And the reason for that is I don't want to write down the formula and, and only afterwards I, I plug in then, uh, well, this, this factor. Okay, how does one determine that? So this is now the practical tool of doing that. We have two times this vertex, so let me first draw it. We have two times the vertex which has um, well, two uh, plane lines and one uh, dashed line. And now, first of all, the symmetry factor always has 1 over the number of identical vertices factorial. In this case, we have 2 times the same vertex, so there is a factor 1 half. Again, I do not motivate where all these Feynman rules come from. Uh, uh, so this is something for quantum field theory, but okay. The number of vertices one has, um, well, one divides one over this number factorial, which is one over two factorial, which is one half. Now the question is, how many possibilities do I have to assign these momenta to my lines such that I get this diagram and not, for example, this? So I definitely want to get this diagram. Now I start with my particle number one. Well, number one in the sense that this is momentum P1. This particle number one, because I have here always the same phi line, this can connect here, or can connect here, or here, or here. Okay? So I actually have four possibilities to assign a P1 assign a momentum 1 to one of these lines. And now I do it. I mean, this is all arbitrary. I have placed them at an arbitrary point on my blackboard. I can also rearrange them if I want. So basically I now, to be concrete, I take this guy here and I call this momentum P1. Now how many possibilities do I have to um, what do we do next? To assign a P3. So P3, remember, is 
this guy here, how many possibilities do I have to assign P3 somewhere there, such that I get this diagram, A. There is only one possibility because in this diagram, as I stressed in the beginning, the P3 meets the P1 at one vertex. Since I have already decided this should be the vertex with a P1, this must also be the vertex with a P3. Okay, now, um, I mean, basically, I, I teach you now how I always determine these factors. There are many ways of doing that. So my, usually my strategy is start somewhere and then go start from that and go along until one ends up with a with the next object. So we have one line left here. And obviously this line must be connected to the second vertex. And how many possibilities do I have for that? Two. I have two because I can connect it to this guy or to that because they are the same phi, they are indistinguishable. And now finally, how many possibilities do I have to connect, well, this here to P2, well, of course, 1, it's just fixed now. And this here, then, will be P4. So the symmetry factor is, um, <coughs> and the symmetry factor is 4. Okay, now, um, now let's write down this diagram. Okay, the general rules are, um, I start with I times M, now of my diagram A, uh, A yeah, is, <coughs> first of all, all the external lines here are scalar bosons, and for scalar bosons one just writes down one. This would be different for fermions, would be different for spin one particles, then one has the spinors, or uh, polarization vectors. <coughs> Here it's pretty simple, so I don't need to consider my uh, external states. Then I have two vertices, and now I really have to draw some uh, <coughs> um, some lines here. Before I can assign any momenta or vertices, it makes sense to give names to all momenta to all lines which then carry momenta and this exchange line here carries a momentum well now I artificially give a direction this carries a momentum because of energy momentum conservation which is P1 minus P3 and um, actually I can also write this as well, also here there is energy momentum conservation. This guy plus this must add up to that, which is P4 minus P2. And if I rearrange that, if I uh, add P3 and add P2, I have P1 plus P2 is P3 plus P4, which completely makes sense. This is overall energy momentum conservation. The energy and momentum of my initial states are P1 and P2, and this must give P3 plus P4. Okay, now comes, uh, after this long story, uh, uh, we collect now factors. First of all, the symmetry factor, 4. <coughs> Next, let's write down the vertices. This vertex here, uh, that's why I've kept that. The vertex is I times one half H times the momenta of the two plane lines with momenta pointing towards the vertex. Um, so it's I times H times R one half. Oops, yeah. This H four. Uh, so, uh, one half h, and I talk about this vertex now. So, what are the incoming momenta here? Well, one is p1, uh, 
And what's the other incoming momentum? Minus, minus P3. P3. This would be this momentum. The P3 is ah, the ah, dash okay, guy. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, so P3 minus P1. Yes, so it's, it's in principle this momentum, but this momentum is going out, so what's going on in is it's negative. So uh, this is what the measure said, P3 minus P1. Okay, this is this vertex. Now comes the propagator, and I always forget the signs of the propagators, so this I have to look up. Um, Uh, so, it's I times the momentum which runs along this line here. The momentum is, for example, P1 minus P3 squared minus M squared. And there is actually an I epsilon which I don't write down now. Um, This was this guy here, an internal line connecting two vertices. This is what we call propagator, and it's this expression. And finally, um, there is this vertex here. And this vertex is, uh, we again read it off here, it's i times h times one half. And now again, the two momenta, the two incoming momenta of the full lines of the plane lines at this vertex, and this is P2 and P1 minus P3. <coughs> okay, now um, let's collect some factors. So first of all, I always count first the i's. Uh, there is one i, two i, three i's. This gives a minus i. <coughs> then next I count uh, the overall coefficient, which is four times one half times one half, which is one. Again, that's why actually one has introduced this one half here, because in most of the cases, this drops out against the symmetry factor. Um, okay, so this was one, I don't write it down. Then I have two factors of h. Okay, gives an h square. And what's then left is um, everything which has to do with momenta, which is uh, <coughs> a p1 times p3 minus p1, a p2 times P1 minus P3 and a 1 over P1 minus P3 square minus M square. Now, as a matter of fact, um, before we finish, let me tell you whenever you calculate a Feynman diagram at tree level, so not with loops. You should get a result for the matrix element which looks real and not imaginary. If it looks, if it has an eye floating around somewhere, then typically you missed an eye in your vertex, or that what you get is i times m and not m and so on. Um, so do this carefully. And typically you, sh you should see what starts with an i m here, but also here there is an i, and this drops out, and then the whole thing looks real. Um, so that's the typical result. If one calculates uh, diagrams with loops, typically they have a real and imaginary part. This has to do with the so-called optical theorem, uh, which I don't want to go into detail here. Uh, but the but a tree-level diagram typically is real. Um, <clears throat> okay, finally, what one would do is one would write the products of momenta in terms, now for a two to two body reaction, in terms of the Mandelstam variables. 
Um, most conveniently here one would use S and T because T is P1 minus P3 squared by definition. Um, so um, let's see what would be the most clever way of rewriting that. <coughs> So probably one would rewrite this here, P1 minus P, oops, I don't need that. P1 minus P3 is actually P4 minus P2. And then I can write this here as P1 times P3 minus P1. I would write this as P1 P3 minus, and my particle number 1 is actually a phi, so this P1 squared is M squared. And um, from T being P1 minus P3 squared, this one can further evaluate to P1 squared plus P3 squared minus 2 P1, P3, what can express, and this here is, uh, let's see, the P1 is, um, P1 square is M square, and the P3 square is capital <coughs> M square, minus 2 P1, P3, which means this P1, P3 I can express in terms of numbers and the T, which uh, in this case is, <coughs> Um, one half times m square plus capital M square minus t minus m square and finally okay so what I managed now is to rewrite this here in terms of t. This here is anyway t. And now let me also rewrite this here. The p t, p2 times p4 minus p2. This is p2 dot p4 minus p2 squared. This is m squared. And well, the t is p1 minus p3 squared, but this is the same as p4 minus p2 squared, and p4 minus p2 squared is actually capital M squared plus M squared minus 2 times p2 dot p4, and therefore I can replace this here. Um, also, I can rewrite this also in terms of t. Um, so this is, if I bring this to the other side, one half m squared plus small uh, m squared minus t minus m squared. <coughs> and then one can plug that in. And one has an expression for the ma in terms of well, in principle, S and T, but S does not show up here. Uh, so in terms of T. And then in the same way, one can calculate diagram B. And I don't do that here because time is over. But uh, first of all, if one calculates there, the symmetry factor is also 4. Check it. But I mean, it's, it's so symmetric. Uh, it's typically very similar to the other diagram. The only thing which is happening, in a sense, is that you replace t by u. Um, which then one can either rewrite again in terms of s and t, or, or stay with a u under some variable. Okay, so these were some practical uh, applications to, um, yeah, well, to the Feynman rules. Tomorrow we start with quantum chromodynamics. And then we will discuss symmetries there, uh, which will well lead to an understanding which processes are possible in quantum chromodynamics and which are 
forbidden by some symmetries, which are very rare because of approximate symmetries and so on. Okay, see you tomorrow.